Hey, what's up? It's Mr. Bill, and welcome to my masterclass at BPM College. Yeah, guys, welcome to our second round, the second uh, get together, uh, our masterclass, our workshop with uh, of uh, Fusion Culture and BPM College. My name is Gurik. I am from the Fusion Culture crew, and we're here in the BPM College. And next to me, I believe this sir needs no uh, presentation, no introduction, but I will introduce him anyways. Uh, Bill, aka Mr. Bill, aka Electrocado. Do I pronounce it right? Is it Electrocado or yeah, Electrocado? Yeah, no, Electrocado is good. Electrocado. Yeah. Okay. It's like avocado, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Probably, probably one of the most known names in glitch, IDM, uh, spheres, uh, genres. Behind him, a lot of releases, a lot of very famous releases, and besides that, he's dealing a lot with uh, movie scoring. And uh, well, he's probably one of the most known teachers and instructors uh, in the online courses of Ableton Live. I'm sure you're all pretty well aware of uh, his uh, "The Art of uh, Mr. Bill" series. A lot of names, a lot of uh, big names, big producers uh, went through his series and studied from his series and ha actually had their very first steps thanks to this gentleman over here. So it's a great honor. It's a great uh, honor having you here. And uh, yeah, welcome. Give him some applause. Woo! So yeah, before we take it from here, um, <coughs> one question. I mean, we usually start with a few questions, but the, this time we decided not to. Mm. But I still have one, like uh, something that troubles me in particular. Mm -hmm. Why avocado? Oh, uh, I don't know, man. It's tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's one of those things that you can like eat every day, and I also feel like it's one of those things you can eat. It doesn't make you feel like shit. And, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's okay. Good. Fair enough. Okay, guys, so enjoy the workshop. Uh, so what I've been, the way I've been thinking about sound design lately is uh, basically from an effects standpoint. So in my opinion, if you're doing synthesis and, and you're mainly thinking about it from the point of oscillators and filters and envelopes, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, if you like listening to a sound, especially in like more experimental music, like glitch, IDM, or you know, bass music these days, or a lot of dubstep, or a lot of that, like I call it clip step, like G Jones and stuff like that, which is fucking awesome. I love that stuff. Um, like those really heavy, insane sounds when you're like, shit, how do I synthesize that bass or whatever? The answer is honestly, start with any input you like, and if you process it enough, it'll eventually sound insane. So. <coughs> That's basically what I'm going to talk about for the first part of this is some different ways that you can think about processing to be the synthesis. So stop, like we're not going to think about synthesis right now as like oscillators and filters and, and stuff. We're going to think about it as like whatever input you like, we're going to do the synthesis with all the effects. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, let's start with, say, um, operator. So. Is everyone in here familiar with operator and everyone knows what an oscillator is and everyone knows what a filter is and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Right, so it's, it's dumb to talk about that at this point. I feel like the, the zeitgeist of the production community and the, is just like on, on a level at this point where it's, you don't need to explain FM anymore. <laughs> you don't need to explain filters and you don't, you know. Um, so let's start with operator. I'm going to do a little bit of FM here. I'm going to turn this up a little bit too. All right, so I'm going to add a tiny bit of FM to this, so it sounds like this. And then let's put, say, a bandpass filter on this, which seems weird because it's already like a pretty subby signal. And maybe let's turn the resonance up a bit. And then maybe a tiny bit of filter envelope. So we have this input now. Like, let's, let's call this the input for our effects. And let's shut operator now and stop thinking about it. So this is our sound. That's, that's the synthesis portion that you would generally be thinking about, right? It's pretty boring. Sounds like what are you going to use that for? It's like a sub or something. 
Um, <clears throat> but let's start processing it. And I'm just going to start slapping tons of effects on this, and I'll show you what's possible with good processing. So I'm going to put glue compressor on here, and I'm just going to compress it as much as I can <laughs> until the input is like essentially starting to clip with soft clipping, which I think to get that actually even starting to clip, we might have to just duplicate this again and maybe again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from there, let's uh, actually, you know what, I'm going to leave all these open just so we can kind of see all of this stuff. Let's turn off soft clipping on these. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds dope. <laughs> uh, from there, I'm going to add a saturator. And let's put a bit of drive on this. I'm going to turn this down now. So you can hear like it's starting to get a, like a little bit of harmonic content in it. So if we turn this off versus on, it's like there's something starting to come out of there. Um, and we could have added that a different way, right? Like we could have added a, like a secondary oscillator or a, um, you know, more FM or something like that to bring out harmonics. Or we could have, there's a multitude of different ways that you could go about adding harmonics to a, to a smooth sound like this. Um, but let's keep going down this road with it and trying to, to add sounds to it in this way or add like harmonic content into, into it this way. So I'm going to put an EQ after this. <coughs> um, by default, I just have my EQ set to cut at 130 hertz, because I pretty much just use this as a thing that I throw at the end of every channel that I want to like remove lows from. So when I'm doing my mix down, it's super easy to just like click channels, click EQ8, and hit enter. Um, and then I, for all my surgical stuff, use like Pro-Q and stuff like that. Um, but for this, let's turn that off. We want to have that just flat. OK, so how, how are we going to add more harmonics? Let's, uh, let's do this. Just add all the high frequencies. You can hear it's starting to get more stuff, uh, more like rich top end harmonics. And let's grab this EQ and let's duplicate it. <laughs> starting to get more rich, right? So the, the point here, I guess, is uh, so far to stop thinking about effects in traditional ways. Like, I think there's been so much drilled into us, um, especially from an academic standpoint. Like, for instance, I studied at SAE in Sydney, and they always told me never to boost with EQs. They were always like, always cut, man, because, you know, linear phase and whatnot, and, you know, it <laughs> sounds bad or something. <laughs> and it's like, it just sounds like you're saying fucking words. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you play around with this, you can get some pretty, like, interesting squashed bass sounds. Let's put a, let's put a multiband compressor here at the end, and let's just slam it with multiband compression. So I'm just going to reduce all of the gain here. And you can see below each of these meters here, uh, I think Windows Plus, there we go. Below all of these meters, you can see it's got like negative amounts of, of gain. So usually what I try and do is just add that gain back on the other end. So for instance, if this is like, let's bring this up a bit. If that's like taking away 24 decibels of gain, I just try and add 24 back. So essentially, you don't lose anything. All you do is crush the dynamics of that area. And I want to crush all the dynamics. Fuck them. <laughs> and let's add more gain here, too. So that's like all of the dynamics gone. Maybe let's just do like 50% of that or something like that. Cool. Uh, you know what? Let's take one of these EQs and let's put it after this too and boost a ton of highs again. At some point, this is going to start to hurt, um, but I'll turn it down so it doesn't hurt too much. Uh, let's duplicate one more time. Okay, so now it's like starting to get into a like a range where you'd probably say it's like harsh almost. Or... Uh, so what I do now is this trick that I figured out uh, the other day with Vakoda. Um, so when stuff gets too harsh, you can really reel it all back in with Vakoda on modulator mode. So Vakoda has a few different modes. It has uh, this noise oscillator mode, which just has the internal noise oscillator within Vakoda. And when you, uh, you know, multiply a noise oscillator with the amplitude of the original signal, it sounds like a noise oscillator, basically, um, which can be good if you're putting it on a sound to add noise to it with the dry-wet control like this, which we don't need to do to this sound. It's already pretty noisy. Um, you can obviously take an external input, which is like the classic Daft Punk thing where you talk and like run a saw wave into it or whatever. And then the pitch tracking mode, it just tries to figure out what the pitch is of the signal going in. And then it tries to use one of its internal oscillators, which is either square, pulse, or 
you know, just three different types of pulse, I suppose, um, and tries to like re-output its oscillator at the same pitch. Uh, the the one that I like is modulator mode, and that just uses its own the input signal going in to to also be the carrier. And if you change the bands to like four or eight, and you put the dry weight up to 100%, and you turn all this down, notice we get no output. So this essentially now is becoming like an eight band EQ. And you can kind of reshape the sound this way by just doing this kind of stuff. So it's like if it's way too harsh, um, let's just do four bands actually. If it's way too harsh in say this area, you just pull it down. Maybe add like a tiny bit of the highs back. And then obviously, uh, you know what, let's put an erosion before this because erosion just adds tons of noise and I like noise. So let's put this over here. Uh, and let's put a saturator on the end here and then in the saturator I'm just going to turn soft clipping on and basically that just means it can't clip so as soon as it gets up towards zero. It's just going to chop all the tops off. But it's going to round them off nicely because it's a soft clipper. So instead of these 40 dBs of crazy gain, we, we just get you know, <laughs> nothing. Um, cool. So at this point, we have tons of processing. Uh, and it's turned sound that originally sounded like this into a sound that sounds like this. Um, the issue is it's not super well articulated. So at this point, I'd probably just go and turn certain things off and certain things I would change a bit. But yeah, the idea is basically to treat this whole effects portion as the synthesis aspect of making the sound rather than treating the synthesis portion as like tweaking an oscillator or tweaking a filter on a synth or something like that. Because so I feel like it always results in too dry of a sound and it doesn't sound like quite processed enough and quite heavy enough. And especially when you're trying to compare, like I get quite a lot of messages from people being like, hey man, how do I sound like X new big artist who's killing it? And like, you know, for a while it was Skrillex, everyone wanted to sound like Skrillex, and then for a while it was like Jaws, and then for a while it was Marshmallow, and like, so always this shit. And I always listen to it, I'm like, dude, it's not that complicated of a sound. Like, the articulation is obviously, like, you know, some basic filter envelope, or like, you know, a saw wave or something like that. But they've just put ass loads of processing on it, and it just sounds so much, like, bigger than everything else because of how hard they processed it. Um, like, for instance, if you wanted to make this sound bigger, you could put a reverb on it, I suppose, that could be good. Um, one thing I like to do a lot with reverb is, is smear it a lot. So um, you have quite a lot of reverb on that signal. Uh, but then what can be fun is like getting a gate, putting the gate directly after the reverb, and then taking the sidechain input from itself pre-FX. So you get that kind of stuff as soon as the reverb is, you know, as soon as the signal is done from operator, it like cuts all that reverb off. So that can be a good way to just like create a more smeared sound. Cool. Um, so this is sounding kind of like shit. Let me turn some of these off. Uh, let's get rid of this. So yeah, I'm just going to tweak this a little bit. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So at this point, now that I've like processed it a ton with all of this stuff that you shouldn't do to anything ever, uh, now the the changes on the synth end will make massive changes on the other end, right? Because if, if it's turning something that's so pure, like a sub, into something super aggressive, like a neuro bass, then like small tweaks on the filter and stuff will like make pretty big changes. So I'll show you what that sounds like. So now the synthesis becomes way more fun because you make tiny changes and it makes giant differences on the other end. Let's mess around with this filter envelope here. Let's try like a, let's see. Um, let's try something with more coarse. Whoa. Turn the spread up, maybe. 
Let's try LFOing some stuff, like the filter, maybe. And then at this point, it's kind of like a balancing act between doing stuff with the, with the operator and the stuff with the effects. But the point is that I feel like not enough people think about the effects. I think that most of the time people just think about the operator, you know, <laughs> or any synth. I mean, like, you know, for instance, if you go, and, and one of the things I've noticed is um, in the last few years is Serum FX has made people, uh, not Serum FX, but Serum in general, has made people start thinking about the effects portion of the synthesis more. Because you'll notice people do some stuff on this page, but then you go to this page and they're like, it's not real sound design unless all of these are turned on. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and like you'll go into people's patches and they'll be modulating like everything in there, you know? And that's I think why in the last few years, I think Serum's had a massive impact on synthesis. Um, because people, I think they, they make the effects so inclusive with the, with the synth itself. So at this point, um, there's a, another thing that I use that I call idea jams. And you, you might notice, like, as I'm playing with all of the stuff on the synth, you're like, man, there's like 16 cool sounds that you just did right there that you could use, like, all of them. And yes, that's true. But automating parameters on, like, all of these effects and the synth and stuff like that is a pain in the ass. So, like, if you want to, you know, have a, you know, a passage of music where the thing goes, well, be a full and does, like, all this crazy shit. You're like, fuck, what's that going to look like on the automation? It's probably going to be like 50 lanes of automation. And like, you know, some of it's going to be so particular, especially with like the filter frequency here. Because if you turn that up a little bit, the signal like disappears. And like, <laughs> um, so, I, so I use this technique that for a while I was calling sound design files. But people were like, sound design files could be anything. And I was like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so I started calling them idea jams. And what I basically do is I hit record um, on a separate channel. I take the input from the channel that I'm doing sound design on, and I just, uh, so for instance, channel two would be taking the input from channel three. Uh, I'd put the record arm on both channels, so my keyboard will trigger the, the operator that's doing the, the source. And then I'll just hit record on the transport, and I'll just start messing with stuff as I'm recording. So that'll look like something like this. Um, and then I'll just keep doing this for like, Sometimes hours, <laughs> sometimes 10 minutes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Pretty clippy. Um, let's see. Yeah, time is a great control on operator. I love this. Um, so does anyone know what time does? All the, all the envelopes at once. So fucking cool. It's great because, like, yeah, you can create, um, you know, some some movement. You know, like, uh, let's say, uh, pitch envelope. And let's make it this a little longer or something like this. And then let's maybe, you know, have a, a filter envelope that does a similar thing but opens up. Something like that, maybe. Oh, yeah. Mm, it kind of sounds like it's breaking too much. It's a bit of a balancing act, this one. Okay, so something like that. And then if we turn the time down, you'll notice that that, that pitch envelope that's really long, the FM envelope, and the filter envelope all at the same time will all get compressed. Which can be super fun. Another thing that I really love about Operator is the loopable envelopes. I feel like people don't utilize these enough. Um, so, for instance, let's. That's just a sine wave now. <laughs> uh, yeah, loopable envelopes, they're so great. Um, so, like, let's say we use the filter here, and uh, let me turn the processing off. And let's say we make this like a low pass filter. And then I'm just going to make this like a basic kind of filter that closes. And let's make this a more harmonic sound, like maybe a saw wave. Yeah, sounds fine. Uh, so down the bottom here in the envelope section, you'll see this little thing that says loop. If you click this, it has a few different options. I'm just going to pick the one that says loop. Um, but they all, they all just loop the thing in different ways. But what it essentially does is takes the loop, the envelope, and then just loops that shape over and over again. So on a filter, that sounds like this. 
Uh, you might need to turn the looping time back and the decay back. <laughs> Sounds like a shot. <laughs> it's gross. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can do exponential stuff with it. Um, and I believe you could probably go here into the pitch envelope and go destination B and ox envelope amount. I don't know about that. Let's not go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, we can also loop the, the pitch envelope. It's going to have pretty similar types of effects, but uh, let's, let's turn that one off. So now, if I mess with the time control, you get stuff like this. So yeah, sounds good. So let's turn the effects on again now and try that. Nice. <laughs> uh, I'm going to close all these effects down just so I can kind of see them all at once. And we can just sort of pick and choose stuff. So maybe like one less EQ in the chain and one less saturator in the chain could be good. Then maybe we should turn the volume up here. Oh, that's another thing to think about. Um, with all the compression that's going on here, uh, the volume control becomes quite important because if you send a, just a little bit of volume into it, so like if you turn this right down and you send like, you know, negative 52 dB into it, it's obviously going to get compressed and saturated way less hard than if you send plus 6 into it. Either way, it's not going to clip because of the soft clipper on the end, but it's going to have like pretty vastly different types of effects going on. Uh, this is getting to be a little bit too fucked. There's like some point where you just destroy the patch and you're like, I have to start again. <laughs> right, let's see, What's, why is this so messy? Let's turn some of this off. Oh, it's probably got a lot to do with this. The damn Vakoda. <laughs> Vakoda's like, what did I do, man? <laughs> You're the one who brought me here. <laughs> nice. Solid neuro bass sound. Let's go back to here and now mess with the with the loopable envelope. some FM back on here. Whoa. Sick. <laughs> Live for that shit. <laughs> okay, cool. So we got a bunch of sound. And now look, we recorded all of it. So this can be useful now, right? Now, now we have one idea jam. That's what I call an idea jam. So now I can... Uh, Keep, keep the patch, I suppose. Sometimes I like to keep the patch. You just group it all up and then hit save and go like, uh, Bill's very cool patch. <laughs> That's like the, the classic thing to call it in a tutorial. It's like, my new song. <laughs> 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 um, and then with this, usually uh, you don't even really have to render it. Um, you can render it, but it's not that important. Because uh, I think you can just click right here on the clip where it has like the audio file number. And you just click that and it just shows up somewhere on your hard drive and then you just go show in Explorer. Um, and then there you go, you just take that, copy that and just put it wherever you put your sound design. So for me, that's probably going to be right here. Oh no, try again. Shit. I guess you have to save the session, which is kind of annoying. Uh, all right, let's call this BPM sound design session. Um, so generally at this point, like doing all the sound design is like one component of the music process, I suppose. Um, obviously you need drums and all that stuff, but you guys didn't want to hear about drums, so we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> um, even though I feel like my drum techniques get pretty damn good these days. Uh, so let me just grab some drums from here. Uh, There's some drums I made the other day. Yeah. Solid drums. Um, so I'm just going to get a drum rack, I suppose. Uh, let's go, where is it? Spain, sound design. Here we go. 
jam one of these in a drum rack. And then let's go grab a kick too, I suppose. I'm gonna stop sounding like kicks. All right, that one's got some nice noise on it. Let's use that one. Um, so from this point, uh, you know, I would usually make a beat and then it's maybe a simpler type of bass line, like a sub or something like that, and then start layering sound design on top of it. And that's kind of like where the thing stops. Or stops or starts? Starts. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's where it stops. And <laughs> depends how I'm feeling, I guess. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe a good, good place to go from here would be to just open up a project file and show you kind of how this like idea jams get used in the, in the end. That, Seems like it would make sense. Um, what's good here? Nothing. <laughs> Actually, this one's pretty good. Let's, let's listen to this one. But yeah, the, the idea, I suppose, is that you kind of do all the articulation just when you're recording and you just mess around. And sure, you don't get like the perfect like little filter sweep that you might get if you're like doing automation or something, but the amount of time you save is insane. Um, so I'd, I'd just much prefer to do everything this way these days. It seems that I can get a lot more done faster than if I kind of go the traditional way about it with like synthesis and automation. Uh, so this is kind of what a session will sort of look like. Um, this is just a basic one, but all of, all of this stuff in the drop here, if you look in here, some of this is coming from idea jams, you know? So it's like this tiny little hit right here is it Z? Yeah, yeah, Ableton 10 shortcuts, I love that. So this tiny little hit here comes from this big file down the bottom of just random stuff. Um, and quite often, you know, it's like this one as well, this is just some random little Roland bass thing. I don't, even, I don't even know how I would synthesize that, maybe like a saw wave with a bit of noise and a filter or something, but I would never intentionally, I think, make something like that. Um, but that's the way that I get to them. It's just by <laughs> kind of mistakes and randomness. Uh, but this is the way this sounds now. So uh, rather than bore you with editing on the spot, <coughs> it might just be more fun to listen to something that's already been edited a ton. Uh, so just keep in mind that every single one of these little sounds that you're about to hear in this section all came from these bigger idea jams. Uh, so it sounds like this. Oh, this is an old ass tune, by the way. It's just something I've been remaking because my production style is much better now. So. So that was just all idea jams. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if we go in and inspect a bunch of these, I mean, it's really it's just one loop that I duplicated a ton of times and then changed a little bit about each time. Because fuck remaking that like every time. There's definitely tricks like to making shit sound way more complicated than it has to be in the creation process. Like if you just make like one four bar loop that sounds really sick and then just duplicate it and change it a little bit and duplicate it and change it a, bit, a little bit. Like just iterate it over and over again. It's a good way to do it. But yeah, so there's a lot of sounds like, um, like this. I don't even know what the fuck that is. It was me just messing around with a synth and like hissing about. Yeah, what's this sound? Hold on, let me just solo this group. Like that kind of stuff. Like, okay, so these two next to each other, like that's, I don't even know how to make that with a synth. I mean, you, I probably could, but <laughs> it wouldn't be fun. Yeah, so it's just like random little sounds everywhere. 
which just all came from this this like drawn out process of making randomness with synths and, and effects. Um, <coughs> cool. All right, let's go back to the BPM session, and I can show you some more effects tricks. Do you when you do like the what you showed us before was let's say you use it as a base. Do you then separate the lows and use the sub separately usually because it's like uh, yeah it's usually I do yeah. Um, and, I, and the reason why I do that is purely just for volume, yeah. like just to try and get the track louder. Um, because obviously uh, low frequencies eat up a lot more headroom in a compressor than high frequencies do. So you want to be able to control them. Um, and if, you, if they're kind of like split into 5,000 different clips, they become really difficult to control. Yeah. So usually what I'll do is I'll put like a, um, uh, like just an EQ8 or something, just cutting at 130. So yeah, you can see here all the mid bases here is just an EQ8 on here cutting at 130, which sounds like this. And then there's these two sub channels here. Um, actually, one of them is only even doing anything. It's just this one. Uh, so yeah, I just recreated a sub pattern over the top. This is one question I get asked a lot too. People are like, how the hell do you get the articulation of like the thing, the exact same in the sub as the, the bass? And like, you know, how are they going to match perfectly? The idea is they don't and they shouldn't, in my opinion. The sub should be a different instrument doing a sub. And the shit on top should be doing top shit. <laughs> so like... <laughs> So like the sub sounds like this. You know? It's like it's it's boring. I think to have the sub and the tops doing the same thing. So. It's like barely the same. I mean, it has the same rhythm and somewhat like implies the melody that the tops are doing. But it's like I didn't look at them exclusively and be like, how am I going to like match it exactly? You know, I just kind of. Eyeballed it and earballed it. They kind of interact, you know, like the, the end of this sub here kind of acts as almost a drum fill. Yeah, that's how I think about sub and, and tops. Yeah, you have, yeah, you have two more. Um, right? uh, nice. um, do you, like, I've noticed a lot of times. If I try to do that trick of uh, like saturating the fuck out of the sound and compressing yeah. it, like the high frequency sounds really dry. Yep. And uh, when I listen to music that I like, it doesn't sound as dry. Mm. So, and reverb doesn't always cut it. It sounds, I, I mean, do you use other effects to get the highs wet? Yeah, erosion is what I would usually use for that. Erosion is basically, um, you can think about it like Vicoda with the noise oscillator, um, except with erosion, I believe, uh, according to the manual, there's like the noise oscillator has a delay on it that's just modulating slowly. So it just sounds like a little bit more lively or something like that. Um, to me, I think the erosion kind of fixes that problem nicely. But if that doesn't fix your problem, the other solution that I would say is to use reverb. Um, and if you were to use the Ableton reverb, uh, you notice it has the input processing area. You can just like use that filter at the start. So it's just applying reverb to the high frequencies. So for instance, um, like let's say I have a snare. I do this on snares a ton. Like for instance that, that's a good example. That's a, a, a dry distorted sound. That sounds like it doesn't have, <laughs> it's been saturated obviously. So let's put high end into it. So let's get a erosion. It's a good start. Uh, that already sounds a, li a bit wet. A little bit, yeah. And then EQ. Um, we can do something there. Uh, and then reverb. It's the input processing area here that you should be concerned with if you're trying to make it brighter. Because you want to you low cut it. Um, usually I'll turn the high cut off as well and just like drag this up. And then it's just going to be adding that. Like that's with the dry wet at 100%. So just a tiny bit of that maybe. And then just mix in a little bit. And then if you want to accentuate that more on the other end, you could use something like multiband dynamics to like reduce the amount of dy uh, dynamics that the high frequencies have. So like something like that. I mean, obviously, you would need to do some more EQ here because that 200 hertz sounds like shit. Wait, 300 hertz. So yeah, they maybe pull some of that out. Also, um, saturators surprisingly do a lot of good to snares. Kind of like glues it all together somehow. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I would maybe think about that problem. 
You'll never use like a chorus or something like that. Oh, no, fuck, no. Not, okay. on, a, not on a snare. <laughs> Definitely not. Any, anything that like splits the signal into two and does different shit in both speakers, you should stay away from that on your drums and your bass. Um, it's great for effects though. Yeah, it depends on the sound. I wouldn't put it on like a main bass. Uh, actually, you could put it on a main bass if it was like not your sub, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, one more question. Last question. Yeah. Do you separate your sessions of like doing that shit to uh, creating music? Yeah, um, sometimes, yeah. Uh, it depends. Um, quite often, I, I'll do it in the same session. And the reason why is because I feel like, uh, you know, you'll have all of your patches just there already. And you, it might just be easier to go like, oh, here's a patch I was using earlier in the tune. So let me do a ton of processing to this and make a new idea jam out of that. And therefore, that's kind of like an iteration of sounds that already existed in the session. So they sound more related, um, which I, I think is good. Because sometimes if you just, like if I did this sound design right here in this room in a completely closed circuit, isolated session that's not related to any other piece of music I'm working on, and then I go to another piece of music and just pull this in, it, it seems to have, like either work really well because it sounds completely different to the rest of the song. So it has like a nice contrast or it just doesn't fit at all. It's like one of the two I've found it, in, yeah. So yeah, I sometimes, I do a lot of this in, in different sessions and I, I'll like spend a day or whatever just making weird noises and shit. Um, but generally, uh, I don't find that they work as nicely or as often as if you do them in the session. But I also don't like stopping writing music to do this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, I guess it just really depends on your workflow as well. Yeah. And you had a question too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's about the idea jams that you do. Um, I, I work like kind of differently. I don't like um, audio samples because they um, like stop me. And I like the automation because I can always change it. I can always um, make what I want with it. So why not record the automation itself? And then you can chop it and make it like and you can make it what you want later depending on the track that you don't, you don't know what will be yeah i actually don't really like the option of tweaking too much um because i find i get too like myopic about stupid shit like um i'll be like oh no this like value has to like go a little bit higher or something and like i'll, I'll like i'll get too tweaky about it so for me personally removing that option is healthy if you make those uh jam sessions, the sound design sessions, only from like wave tables, stuff like that. Do you use maybe, uh, I don't know, percussions, snares, I don't know, any, any kind of samples just to like recreate them, resample and just put a lot of process to make it something like completely different? Yeah, so like here's a, another example of an idea jam. This is clearly not from a synth, this is from drums. It's just a bunch of granular drums. This is actually something that somebody from my label sent me, so they, I didn't even make this one. This is just like a concept that we all use now. <laughs> like that's obviously just drums run through like oh, granular, granulizers, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, quite often our idea jams are definitely not limited to synths and definitely not limited to bass sounds and not limited to anything. Like it's just, the, the, the concept is to like take the tools at your disposal use them in ways they're not supposed to be used or just really creative ways and just record the output and then figure out how to contextualize it for music later. The OTT trick. <laughs> this, is a, this is a fun one. Okay, so does anyone know about all pass filters? Yeah, you don't know about all pass, okay. So the way an all pass filter works is it takes the low frequencies of a signal and the high fre frequencies of a signal and it puts them out of phase. So phase being the time domain, right? So like if something's in phase, it means they're playing at the same time. If you start to move them slightly out of time, they start to become out of phase. Um, so all pass filters try to do that intentionally. They try to phase the highs and the lows, uh, but in like a pretty linear way. Um, and it has this interesting sound. The issue is that Ableton doesn't have an all pass filter. So if you wanted to use an all pass filter, you'd need to use like serum effects or something like disperser from Killer Hearts or something something else. Um, but I figured out a way to do it in Ableton, but it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, and this is like, probably shouldn't repeat this to anyone. So. <laughs> uh, all right, so we have a kick. Um, let's see. All right, great. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the preset from multiband dynamics called OTT. Uh, well, first of all, let me, yeah, let me show you the OTT trick first. So I'm going to drag OTT here onto the channel. Uh, so that's compressing it quite a bit. Uh, I don't want it to compress, right? So what I'm going to do is go to the amount control here. And I'm just going to turn this down to 0%. So if we turn this on and off, it's not doing anything, right? The way that a multiband compressor works is it needs to have split points. So it needs to be able to compress the low frequencies and the high frequencies separately from the mid frequencies. So it needs like, in multiband dynamics, you have like a splitting it into three different parts. And the way that a splitter works is by using EQs. And the way that an EQ works is via delays and phase. So for instance, like if you want to take 300 hertz out of a signal with EQ8, um, if you turn 300 hertz down by two decibels, what that's actually doing is taking two decibels of 300 hertz out of the EQ, sending it back into the EQ and putting it out of phase. Does that make sense? So it's, so it's turning that area down by two decibels because it's 100% out of phase or 360 degrees out of phase just in that area. So, so knowing that, we know that this has EQs in it and it's going to do something to the phase, right? And if we remember what an all-pass filter is, it's putting the low frequencies out of, out of phase with the high frequencies. So how do we use OTT in this mode at 0% to be an all-pass filter? The answer is, what's that? Yeah, well, you can group it. The, no, the answer is to duplicate it 100 times. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's it. That's the whole trick. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something I found interesting. I was like, I should, I should mention that. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'd run out of ideas one day, and was like, what's next? <laughs> So this can be a cool effect to use on idea jams. If you want to have an all-pass filter on your idea jams, and you're like, oh, I don't have money to buy an all-pass filter. So it's a cheap all-pass filter. Um, so there's actually a plugin that just does this. Um, I'll actually let, let me just keep the OTTs here so we can compare uh, dick sizes on the plugins. Um, <coughs> so let's put disperser here after. So this is also the same thing. So you can hear it basically just does the exact same. And if we turn disperser off and turn the OTTs on, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, this is a bit nicer. It gives you a split point that you can change. And then a pinch size, which I don't ask me what that one does, but maybe resonance. And then just an overall amount control. So how much it's doing it by. So Disperser, in my opinion, is way better. It's way, way less CPU heavy than 100 OTTs. Um, and it, it just sounds nicer. Uh, the other option is Serum FX's uh, all-pass filter, uh, which, in my opinion, isn't great, but it has one. It doesn't really sound the same, though. Maybe you have to modulate it. Oh yeah, here's a question. Um, well, it's not a question, I have a solution, but. Um, <laughs> uh, does anyone know how to make Serum FX's modulation work on yeah, a? Yeah, I was just about to ask this. Yeah, it's an easy solution. Um, so right now you can see this modulator is not triggering when I trigger the MIDI note. I think if you have note latch turned on, it sometimes works, but notice how it's okay, just. What's the question? Uh, so the, well, it's not really a question, there's a problem. The problem is that I have Serum FX on a channel where I'm triggering a simpler, but this could be on any channel. It could be on, I don't know, anything. Anything that's not just like Serum is the first thing in the chain. Um, and the, the problem is that you want uh, every time you trigger a MIDI note for the modulators to trigger with that MIDI note. So like when you say have a filter modulation, like a saw down type thing on a filter, that when you hit something it goes and like closes the filter. The issue is that when you turn note latch on, it just keeps oscillating through that movement. And when you have note latch turned off, you trigger it and it doesn't do the thing at all. So the solution is to come to the first thing in your chain, uh, hit Control G to put that in a group. And then you want to put a device here called external instrument. And what this allows you to do is send the MIDI to another place. 
So what we want to do here is send the MIDI to the same channel, three instrument rack, and notice it'll just hook itself into Serum FX. And now, if we go over here and we put this envelope on trigger, you can see it just behaves exactly as it would regularly in Serum. So yeah, um, so another fun fact. That's a mark for a live uh, No, that's a standard Ableton thing. Yep. Yep. So yeah, anyway. The point was that I wanted to modulate this all-pass filter just to see if it was uh, comparable to Disperser, and the answer is no. So, uh, what else have I got on my list of tricks here? <laughs> oh yeah, artifacts. Let's talk about artifacts. Um, <clears throat> so recently I was chatting with Woolg, and he was like, here's a cool, dumb trick, and I'm like, I love cool, dumb tricks. And then he was, uh, yeah, everyone loves cool, dumb tricks. Uh, so, so the point of this one, and I have a tutorial about this already on the internet, so apologies if you've already seen that. Um, the tutorial is called Discovering Artifacts in Time-Based Effects. And this is perfect for idea jams. It's so good for this uh, kind of stuff. So the, the idea is that you take an impulse of any kind. It can be like a, like a drum, or it can be like a synth stab, or like just anything. Like, let's just make it like a clap or something. Uh, wait, that's not a thing. Here we go, clap. Let's chuck this clap in a simpler and play it back. Cool. Great. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. <laughs> it's going to leave you hanging. All right, uh, so let's put a reverb on here. So that's very cool. Um, reverbs have this thing called an RT60. Does anyone know what that is? Some people? Okay, I'm going to explain it. An RT60 is the amount of time that it takes the reverb to get 60 decibels below its first point. So like where that reverb is when it starts, once it gets 60 decibels quieter than that, that's the RT60. Because 60 decibels down is said to be where we don't hear it anymore. And this is usually important in acoustics. Like RT60s are, are usually in a room. Uh, you get a test mic and you'll send an impulse through the room. And then the acoustician will be like, oh, man, the RT60 is like one second in here. And you'll be like, oh, shit. <laughs> How do I fix that? <laughs> um, but, the, but the thing is, is below 60 dB, there's still stuff going on. We just can't hear it. Um, so Wolg's idea was, how can we get to hear that stuff? Because I'm interested in what's down there. Like, that's, that's the kind of stuff where, you know, all the details and shit that you're not supposed to hear can be heard. Um, so the... So the idea is to get a reverb and then put a utility after it and turn the utility up by all the dBs, like 35. And then you duplicate it like five times. So you're adding like hundreds of decibels. No, not hundreds. Maths. A lot. 170 or something. Um, and then you put a soft clipper on the end. So such, uh, actually, you know what? Let's put, a, let's put Ableton's limiter on the end so it sounds worse. <laughs> OK, so right now we have this. So I just turned the sound card right down because it's loud. But you get this. It's reverb, and then it just stops. So like whatever tail was there, like the RT60 eventually kind of is told by the DSP to stop. It just stops. So it's kind of fun. It's also kind of fun watching the signal like linger through this chain. You can kind of see them drop off one by one. Still there somehow, even though I can't hear it. Uh, but the cool thing is to put a saturator before this and have it on wave shaper mode and just add a little bit of a curve. Um, so this thing in the middle here is called a transfer curve. Uh, I don't understand how it works. If you go to the Wikipedia page, it's tons of long equations. And they talk about a thing called FFT a lot. And I don't understand FFT because I'm not a computer programmer. Um, but now look at this. We get something like this. You get like a weird little artifact on the end. So, so this is super fun. Once you start messing around with this transfer curve and the, and the reverb, like messing around with some of the input processing and, and stuff like that, you can get some pretty interesting effects out of it. Pretty cool. Yeah, I like it. It's fun. Let's add some drive. Let's mess around with this. Let's have more decay time, and let's turn the stereo on the size down. Let's have more size. 
sounds pretty cool. Uh, let's put something that's more interesting, like a soul wave. <laughs> and that's probably less interesting. But... Nice. So let's start recording some of these into our Idea Jam channel. So let's hit number two here and just hit record. Pretty cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to note is that not all reverbs are the same. Like some sound shittier than others. So Ableton's one sounds especially shitty. But if you like get other ones, like uh, Tora Verb or something like that, this is a really nice one. You get different artifacts out of it, right? Because like the coders think about how it's going to decay in different ways and how to make it sound nicer. So. Like, see how at the end it doesn't decay as like disgustingly as Ableton's one. Um, for this purpose, I don't like that. I like stuff that decays shit. Like, it just it just sounds like garbage once it gets past the RT60. Um, you can do this also with with any time-based effects. So this will work with chorus. If you turn feedback up on chorus, let's record one of these. <laughs> nice. Let's turn the amount down. Not as interesting as I would hope, but still kind of cool. Let's try and get some out of some delays. So say like use a ping pong or something like that. Ping pong wide, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that shit. Ugh. It's disgusting. <laughs> all right, so like, if we take that and put all our OTTs on that last bit now, that's going to sound pretty cool. So like, let's take, say, this little bit at the end. I like that sound a lot. So let's put our OTT chain here, which is just all the OTTs. And that's kind of like wet. So let's record this down into like maybe a, well, you know what, let's just record this whole section here um, into the channel below it. So we get something like this. Sweet. Uh, it could be fun to take that end bit there and maybe pitch it down a bunch because it seems like it's got a lot of nice highs in it. And usually when something has nice high frequencies in it like that, if you pitch it down, you kind of still retain those, but it just gets like fatter and lower. So this kind of stuff. So let's pitch that down one octave with no warping turned on, which means also the articulation of it will be stretched to half its length. Because when you play something an octave lower, it plays at half the speed. Great. Yeah, so yeah, that's fun. Um, let's record that one too, just so we have that too. <coughs> Sweet. So yeah, this is kind of my sound design process. It's just <laughs> doing stuff you shouldn't do <laughs> and seeing what happens. And then on the other end of it, obviously, there's like a, a like creative portion where you have to figure out how to make it musical. Um, but that's like a whole other two-hour talk, I feel like. <laughs> um, but that's, okay, I guess, where like the project file walkthroughs would be important. So I feel like writing music in front of people is like it's usually weird. Never turns out great. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so the concept of, of using the idea jams is obviously just to have tons of articulation. So one way that you can make use of this, let me import a beat real quick into here. Um, or actually, how about I? How about I just go to a project file that's like pretty much, like just a beat, so it's not really like finished at all, and then we can just start working from there. So at least we have a point to start from. So otherwise, I'm going to be like, oh no, this kick should go here, and this. Kick. Um, all right, this one is pretty fairly unfinished. So let me go into here, and then I'll just take all this sound design we just did drag it into that project, and then we can maybe incorporate some of it. And then that will also answer your question as to whether or not that's how I do it, and we'll see <coughs> if it works. Uh, all right, so here's the track. Uh, so to get, um, to get uh, all the sound design from that other session into this session, uh, you can actually just go to where, uh, where, your, where your session is. So here, you can just grab this and just drag it straight in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for some reason, no one knows that. <laughs> it's weird to me that no one's ever tried it. I'm always just like, fucking get in there. And, then, <laughs> and, <it's>, and it works. <laughs> All right, so we have some sound design here. Let's put this in a group and just call this sound design. 
And I'm going to turn this group off for the moment. And this is just going to be kind of where my stuff is. And quite often, I'll have a group down the bottom called sound design, and it'll be colored black like this, um, just to denote to me that it's not being used and that that's just where I can pull resources from if I want. Uh, all right, so this is where the tune stands right now. Oh, it's subby. It sounds familiar. Uh, tutorial. Yeah, I did have this in a tutorial. just like a weird little hip hop beat. Um, so let's maybe just take this beat and duplicate it because I feel like this section's sort of fine. Um, so I'm just gonna duplicate this, all this stuff over to here and then we can uh, talk about how to maybe incorporate some of the sound design. Oh, here's another thing probably worth talking about is my mix template quite often is just two groups. Um, is just drums and then everything that's sidechained. <laughs> that's my entire mix template, which, which makes total sense. I mean, it sounds funny, but like, um, I mean, what are you generally doing? You're, you're side chaining everything to your kick and your snare. And with Ableton 10, you have groups and groups. So you might as well just chuck it all in one thing and just put a MIDI triggered side chain on the whole thing. So, like, every time the kick and snare hits, it just takes everything and just turns it down. <laughs> Um, and then in the, in the drums group, in my kick and snare channel, I just have, yeah, this external instrument thing again. So every time the, the kick comes in, it just like sends the MIDI to the gatekeeper. Uh, question? Yeah. Is there any difference between uh, doing a compressor sidechaining with a limiter part sidechaining? <coughs> well, this isn't a compressor. This is a, like a triggered yeah, I know, volume envelope. But, uh, I ask about the, about the compressor sidechaining. Like if there is a difference in the sound. From, from using a MIDI triggered volume envelope? No, with a limiter. No, with, like, Wait, you can sidechain a limiter? Yeah. Oh, you mean like with VST3 like this? I've never tried it. So yeah, I don't know. I, I imagine it's probably the same, because I mean, all a compressor or all a limiter is is a compressor with infinite gain reduction. So yeah, it would probably just sound the same. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've been using the MIDI triggered version for so long that I've just kind of given up on sidechaining with compressors in general. Um, Okay, cool. So let's remove some stuff. Uh, what could we remove here? Let's remove this. Uh, I love this sound, but let's remove it. <laughs> it's like the cheesiest drum sound ever. So this is basically just sub and... Well, I'm going to use headphones for this. Oh, yeah, nice. Okay. So let's see, where could we cut sounds into? So I'm going to create a channel here. I'm not going to name it because fuck naming things. And then I'm going to take this and just copy this file over here into this channel. So now we just have a portion of a really long sound design file in the channel. And the portion I pick sounds like this. Um, which I don't really like. So I'm going to turn warping off here. Uh, and quite often, the way I'll scrub through these is I'll just hit uh, Control D to like duplicate the thing, and I'll press zero, and that'll turn the one off next to it. And then now I'm free to drag this playhead all the way out and just use this playhead to scrub through to just find a section that I like. So I'm going to pitch that up one semitone so it's in the same key as the track. And then let's make it like nine decibels louder, um, which is obviously just an arbitrary amount, just however much I felt like it needed. Uh, and then let's see how that sits at the st on the one. I mean, it sounds OK. It's probably better stuff in the file, but you know, let's just for the sake of it leave that there. So I'm going to duplicate this again. Again, duplicate the clip, turn the one next to it off, and then I'm just going to drag through this file and try and find another section that makes sense. So a lot of it's just like dragging the playhead around and using transposition to like change the pitch and the length. 
So this could be fun. Um, this could be good with, this. both of these layers could be good with some filtering because the whole song is sort of subdued in the first place. So, you know, perhaps a little bit of this kind of stuff could be good. So basically when the sound starts, it's just shutting a filter on. Uh, this could be good to have another sound here. So like a duck out. Um, so let's take, say this sound here, copy it over here, turn it on, and then open the filter just for this sound. And just pick like maybe a more transient sound from here, like uh, maybe this. Or perhaps maybe one of the clicks on the end of one of these. Uh, what's this one sound like? Yeah, it's kind of like a little percussive click. So we have. Um, we could maybe even put these on the starts of all the bars and then just change them slowly over time. So like I was talking about, iteration, that can be a good way to get stuff done quickly. Uh, so let's see, what do we got here? Let's maybe remove some stuff. So all these subs here we could maybe... Uh, we probably need that sub. What's this? Yeah. Uh, and then maybe this next one here, we could pick a different part of the file. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, sometimes you'll just get like little accidental stuff like that. That kind of makes sense. It needs a little bit of, uh, needs to be changed a little bit. So let's turn it down and then drag this first playhead around. And what I'm actually looking for as I'm dragging this first playhead around is where this second sound starts from. So you notice if this first playhead is over here, this second sound starts before the next beat that I would want it on, which is 58.1.3. So if I drag this back, you get it starting right there. Let's see if we can get that more correct. Yeah, because you also want this sound here to start on 56.1.2. So it just becomes sort of like a balancing act of transposition and playhead position. But yeah, that's the idea. Makes sense. Um, some other things that we can do to, to use uh, these in, in interesting ways. So we can say, put the idea jam in a sampler. And if you open up this entire sampler's playhead regions to, to encompass the entire file, uh, you can put it on slice mode and you can mess with the sensitivity here and you can see how it's just kind of picking random cuts. So sometimes that can be fun just to like pick a bunch of random cuts and then play around on a keyboard and just find bits that you like. Um, it's kind of interesting, I guess. I don't know, could be good for a piece of percussion, I suppose. Um, Another thing you can do is you can turn this into a wavetable, which I'm sure everybody already knows, but it's something that you might overlook once you've already done this much in the sound design process. You're like, I've already done so much. Why do I need to now turn it into a wavetable? Um, the answer is because fucking why not? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to drag these playheads in, put it on classic mode, turn looping on, and just do the classic loop a tiny, tiny amount of the sample, and that makes it a wavetable. Uh, and then if you move it around with the start position, Turn snapping off. Now if we move the start uh, position around, this is just like scrolling through a wavetable on Serum or something now. So you can maybe make new sounds that way, I suppose. Um, another thing I like to do quite often with these is, uh, especially if it's a percussive sound design file or an idea jam, I'll hit warp and then I'll just loop like a tiny little part of it, so um, you know, half a bar's worth or something. I'll just sort of loop that. Um, and then I'll just loop the whole thing over the top of a sequence like that, and then do some weird stuff to it, like pitch it up and use this beats mode to... something like that. And then just see how that percussively sits over the top. And if you're like, oh, I don't like that bit, well, then you just drag the whole loop to somewhere else and notice how it's just changing the position. 
So if we just remove tons of this stuff now and just keep the subs in that, it can probably sound like a nice subdued groove. And you can quite often come across rhythms you would never think to do this way as well, because you would never like sequence stuff like off in that, that way. Because, um, you know, everyone likes stuff to be perfect, mostly. That sounds cool. Yeah, you can create a groove file and then apply it to everything else. If you wanted to like make that the like God groove in your song where everything adheres to that, then yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah so that's another fun thing you can do with it. Um, quite often if I make something that's as transient as that though, I'll uh, put something like corpus on it or something to like re-bring the, the decay portion into it. It's out of time. I think you can just uh, highlight a section of audio um, and you can just press Command, uh, sorry, Control Shift U and just quantize to the current <laughs> grid. Bam. So some interesting stuff you can do there. And then you can obviously go through the entire thing we just talked about again and reprocess that to all sorts of different stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, there is any uh, options in Ableton <coughs> to split all the, uh, the idea wave into a separate uh, clips? Yes, there is. I'm glad you asked. Um, so what you do is you take uh, like an idea jam section. So let's take a pretty populated section because you don't want parts with a lot of silence in them. Otherwise, it's some of the clips are going to be silence. Um, so let's take this. I guess this looks pretty populated. Uh, let's hit warp. Um, so warp, yes. I'm going to right click this. Whoa, what did I just do? Uh, I think I accidentally selected Z from that menu. Um, so I'm going to select Slice to New MIDI Track. And you do Slice to New MIDI Track based on the transients. So every time there's a transient in the file, it's going to create a new clip from there. So then you go, bam, and now it's going to create 50, 50 clips. Yes, but it really does create the clips. Um, well, actually, no, it doesn't. It puts them all in these little samplers, but it just like moves the playheads to where they need to be. Um, for what reason would you want them to be the clips, just to like export them into a sample pack? If I want to, to play with the, with the waves, you know, to arrange the, the waves yeah. separately. Uh, yeah, I don't think I open as a good way. Instead of uh, cut it and split okay. it. Yeah. Maybe you can put it in a sequencer and just put it on random. Yeah, so that's another cool thing that you can do with it. Um, yeah. So for instance, here, let me show you this trick, because this was going to be one of the next tricks that I was going to talk about. Uh, let's just take this file and stretch it, because we want for this next trick, we want the file to be totally populated. We don't want any silence. So let me just cut the front of this off and the end of this off and put this on complex mode. Nice. Let's go Control J and consolidate that into its new a new file. It's basically just a weird sounding bass at this point. So now if I drop this into a sampler, the point of this is that uh, I'm going to want to just select random parts of the file without like making any decisions on it. So I'm going to turn this into a sampler. And then at the start, uh, well, actually, you know what? Let's go to the MIDI panel first and talk about that. So in the MIDI panel here, you can send different kinds of MIDI information into, into the sampler to, to modulate different things. So for instance, the key is obviously which key you're sending in on a keyboard. So if you send a low key in, like C negative 2, that's going to be like a low modulation point. And if you send like C8 in, that's going to be like the highest modulation point. And if you attach this to say the filter, um, so let's say we attach that to filter frequency, and then we turn the modulation amount up by 100, um, then the lowest notes, so let's just demonstrate this real quick by turning on the filter. The lowest notes down here are going to be completely filtered. So to the point where you can't hear them 
it looks like, and the highest notes. You can hear as I'm going up in the, in the octaves with the MIDI notes, it's opening the filter more and more because the key source is acting as a modulation, sorry, the key input is acting as a modulation source for the filter. So that's super cool, but this is a super boring thing to do with this technology. So, <laughs> so instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, set the velocity here to select a random part of the sample, so sample offset, and then I'm gonna turn the modulation amount up to 100. So if I play in different velocity notes now, all at the same pitch, so let's say I just play in like a bunch of stuff at C3, like this, and just loop that a bunch of times. And and let's turn this up a little bit. Okay, so now uh, I think you can, what is it, you hold Alt and, or Control and just draw over it, yeah, like that. So you can hear now that there's different, um, or you can see rather, now every time there's a different velocity note, it just selects a different part of the sample, so check out the playhead now. Notice how it's just jumping around. So that's pretty cool. Um, although I don't really want to draw the notes in to do that because that's a pain in the ass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an arpeggiator here at the start of the chain. Uh, and then we play a note in. We get the classic arpeggiated note thing, which looks like this. So you can see that it's just triggering the sample constantly from the same spot. So how can I randomize the velocity? Velocity. velocity. There you go. Yeah, there's a plugin that just does it. So you go, velocity, you just turn this random control up. Now I can just play it, it's just triggering random parts of the sample. Which is super cool. For this sound, it might not be that interesting, but like, let's say go back to that sound I was using before, which is the granulized drums, and put that in here. Basically a granulizer almost. Yeah man, I'm an IDM genius. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's every IDM artist in their studio when they figure this out. Let's put a pitch envelope on all that stuff. Let's do some steps on the arpeggiator so it changes pitch. Sounds like wet. <laughs> um, let's put disperser on that. That could be fun. Some all-pass filtering to make it a bit more sticky. So that could just act as some nice percussion on the top of this. So if I just like go down here and create one long MIDI note, for instance. Why is there so many things selected? Here we go. Let's hit legato to just make that one long MIDI note. Um, and then just play this, just run this over the beat, and maybe that would sound cool. Maybe 16th note. Yeah, pretty fun. <laughs> So there's a bunch of ways that you can take these idea jams and use them musically. It's really just like up to how creative you can be with repurposing stuff in musical ways. And it, yeah, that's it. You have a resample thing. Is that like a channel name? Yeah. yeah. Uh, resample the yellow one. Ah, oh, right. Oh, I got that from a YouTube thing. Yeah, I just recorded that off YouTube. Um, <laughs> like a one hour jazz performance. <laughs> Not, not really, yeah. Um, it's just in a sampler, and then um, I just took like one cut of this, which uh, so I just took this tiny little cut. So I use it in the same way that I would use an idea jam, really. It just sounds like that. And then I just put three notes. <laughs> Just the whole album just went like, oh, that, that one second. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. No, of course not. <laughs> I, uh, I just was like, I want some piano. So I just like searched on YouTube jazz piano and then just like dragged this in and then just sort of sifted through. 
that and so on. Well, I mean, it is realistic. Uh, not, not even that. It's just that sampling stuff has a different sound to it, you know? I don't know if I should turn the mic on because it's kind of bad. I think the mic is more for like the recording so that like when the thing goes back on the internet, they, it's not me just answering nothing. Is this master class going up to the internet? Yes, this master class is going up to the internet. Um, but yeah, I mean, that just it just has a different sound, like sampling it, because um, so there's a thing in jazz called planing. Does anybody know about this? Does anyone in jazz music? What? Planing. Planing. It's where you take a chord and you just play the chord exactly the same up and down the thing. And obviously with sampling, that's all you can do, because you can't change the notes of the sample. So, so it sounds like planing. It has a certain sound to it. And every time I would do sampling in, when I was teaching at Berkeley, because Berkeley is a jazz school, everyone's like, that's planing. <laughs> I was like, shut up, you jazz nerd. <laughs> but yeah, there is a name for that, actually. <laughs> but that, like, it, it just has that sampled sound when you just, say pick a chord and just move it up and down the, the keyboard. That's why I do it, not, not because I want it to sound more realistic. I actually think computers are really good at sounding unrealistic, so I try and do that more, more, more like that kind How of sound. Like, avoid like, having the unnecessary harmonies in, in these samples, kind of? Well, you, you just, just got to be like careful. Quiet. Yeah, you, no, you have to just be careful about which part you pick. Like, for instance, um, if I pick, like, this part, maybe. It might not work as well. Actually, it works okay. <laughs> but, like, let's pick a song maybe in a different key, because surely, like, somewhere in this hour they played a song in a different key. Um, maybe, like, back here. This dude's talking. Like that probably wouldn't work so well. Nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just a matter of finding a good little bit that you like, and it's what they call digging, as the old Jay Diller types would call it. He was a real digger. You released a few uh, sound uh, like sample spec uh, that I, that you can buy from your site. Mm -hmm. uh, one's called uh, Volume 6, uh, Buses and Stuff. I, I don't remember. You you have some uh, group of samples called Tips Bus. The yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I'd like to know how you how you make them. Like I know it's a similar process, but is there any specific sound you used in the beginning to make? Um, if you, yeah, if you want to make stuff that sounds like Tipper, Razor is what you should use. You okay. used, you used Razor before? No. Razor is a reactor library. I don't even know if I have it on this computer. Um, let me see. I don't use it that often, mostly because I think it sounds a lot like Tipper, and I don't want to like sound exactly like Tipper. Not that I, like I love Tipper's music; it's amazing. But I find like as soon as I start using Razor, I'm like, fuck, it sounds like Tipper. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like I don't know. I yeah. Yet here I am using old Ableton native stuff, being fine with that. So maybe uh, yeah. Surely I've got Razor here somewhere. Oh yeah, was that it back there? Yeah, that's it, cool. All right, so let's load up a uh, reactor here. Um, so everyone knows reactor, right? Yeah. 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 All right, let's try and drag Razor in here and see if it's usable. I might have it unlicensed at the moment. Yeah, you seen this one? Okay, so let's uh, initialize it. The, the only way I've found to initialize this is to go down to Aerosmith and then go to init. For some reason, they put it there. And it's still not totally initialized, but it's the closest, it's the best we got. Um, all right, so we start here. So Razor is an additive synthesis, uh, additive synthesizer, which means that it makes all of its sounds by adding sine waves together. Um, and you can kind of see all those sine waves right there on the graph. That's a perfect representation of what it's doing. Um, and if you turn a filter on and have the cutoff go down or up, uh, rather than actually subtracting in the way that a subtractive synthesizer would by removing those high frequencies with like an EQ with phase, it just turns down the sine waves, which is cool. It sounds super, super clean. Um, but it sound, has a certain sound to it, like this. So that's just the filter with a saw wave. It's like already sounding pretty tippery. Yeah. Has that kind of real wet sound. Um, and then there's some really cool uh, oscillator types here, like sick pitch bend or number pitch bend is pretty cool. 
There's probably like some combination of this stuff. It's like a valve filter here or a foreman filter. Yeah, this, this stuff could be good for idea jams too if you just messed around with this for like an hour. You'd have all the sounds. Oh, this reverb sync thing is pretty fun. Let's uh, go back to... Yeah, like smears everything. Yeah. I would suggest playing with this. A lot of wet <laughs> bass music sounds in there. Kind of like Sixus and shit like that. So, so I, I know Sixus uses Razor a lot as well. Yeah. Um, where, where do you get like those little percussions from? You just create I, idea jams, like, granulizing <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, just granulize stuff and just find little bits. Yeah, I don't really like use sample packs that much anymore. <laughs> so everything is just generated from sound design, like you're just doing random stuff and then trying to use it in creative ways to 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 create new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You sometimes like use uh, vocoders uh, to make your drums maybe like a bit more kinda noisy. Unique kind of. Yeah, yeah. You can you can use vocoders in interesting ways on drums for sure. So like we put a vocoder on the kick and the snare here. Uh, let's put it on like noise you, mode. You do like uh, some specific process for the drums in the tracks. Yeah, I do very specific things, but no one here wants yeah, to hear about Yeah, no it. one knows to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you can put it... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, putting a vocoder on and using the noise the noise mode is pretty cool. Though. You can add like nice uh, like high frequencies to kicks and snares like this. Versus, you know, it's kind of like a cool way to make them sound more excited. Yeah, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, I was wondering about your workflow and your creative process. Uh, is there like an idea which you uh, try to materialize or do you just kind of roll with uh, whatever happens during your sessions? Um, so I would say I've thought about this quite a bit as well because like I started to have a bit of an existential crisis because I was like, oh, I never really like come up with any musical ideas. So am I even really a musician? Because like my whole thing is just like based out of process. It's like all of it is just a product of the process. Um, but then I thought about it and I was like, no, that's not necessarily true. What it is is that I'm a really reactive artist, which means that like I am not good at like starting with like a very clear idea and being like, all right, here's something. I'm going to just write this from start to finish and bam, done. And I'm glad I'm not that way because that sounds boring as fuck. Like <laughs> to just be like, I've got the perfect idea. Now time to execute it and execute it going home now like that that sounds super boring to me so like what I do instead is I make the computer do a bunch of crazy stuff that will like influence me in different ways so it's kind of like an IO type circuit where it's like all right let's introduce some randomization on this end and then on my end I can be like oh that gives me another idea now you know or like you know it helps me and, and it's the same reason why I like collaborating so much is because you know quite often I'll be in the studio I'll get stuck then somebody else will just do something I would never have thought to do whether or not it's like good or bad in my opinion, but it might generate another idea. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of my process is re reactivity. And whether, an, whether or not I'm doing that with another person or by myself, um, that's, this is how I go about it, is by kind of creating these like random processes. How do you go about the arrangements in your track? Like how would, um, you, would, would you build a track? Like would you go with an idea like... like you mean like, uh, like structures? Yeah. Like verse, chorus. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, usually it just takes me a lot of time. Uh, and usually what I'll do is I'll create like many different versions of, of a, like a drop, for lack of a better word. And then I'll sort of figure out which ones I like, which ones I don't. Um, and then I'll just like delete some. And then I'll start, uh, you know, figuring out which ones I think work best in terms of the energy and, and stuff like that. Uh, I'll open up a project now and I'll kind of show you a good example of that. Uh, but yeah, it's, <coughs> it's not that uh, like well-founded on like music 
theory or anything like that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I haven't studied like, like contemporary music or anything. I think what's interesting is that to me is like, would you go with an idea and just let it flow and run with it and see where it takes you, or would you construct a, like a song with like some sort of a structure, like you know, like a build up, a drop, and then like some sort of a verse and a build up and like. Yeah, I do, but I also find that when I do that. I'll do like the first little bit of a tune. I'll be like, all right, build up, drop, break down, and then now I'm stuck, yeah. you know? And, and then I also find that if I just let it like take me where it's taking me or whatever, I also find that it just sounds like it meanders too much and it's like a bit boring and it doesn't like, you know, I like tracks that get to the point. Yeah, very concise. Yeah. yeah, I like concise tracks with like a lot of sections and stuff like that. Um, so quite often I'll make these like boring uh, ideas and then boringer, yeah, uh, <laughs> more more boring ideas, and then I'll slowly kind of like just remove parts of them I don't like and add in more interesting stuff over time. Like for instance, this track here, this is like a bit of a beast of a project file. Um, it's a newer one, huh? Yeah, Apophenia, yeah, it's off my last album. So the first thing I did here was I made this first section, right, which sounds like this. Uh, whoops, not that section, this section. Should we get a tiny bit more volume? Just a little bit, a little bit more up. So it's like if I just took that section and wrote a whole tune out of that, I would say that this would be a pretty boring tune. Um, what makes it interesting is it has tons of different ideas in it. And, and the main idea that I had here for the like arrangement type stuff, I guess, was that I made this snare with Zebra 2 using comb filters and the reverb, and it sounds very metallic like this. <coughs> and then here I kind of started doing a bunch of automation to it and trying to just make an interesting sounding snare. And my idea for that was like, how can I, does anyone know what reharmonization is? It's like, yeah, it's like a jazz idea. It's where people, uh, people do it on the internet all the time and I think it's the coolest shit ever. They'll take like a, and I do it a lot in my own music, they'll take like a Beyonce vocal or something like that and then they'll just throw insane chord progressions over it, like E major with all the numbers after it. <laughs> and then like, you know, a C sharp, whatever, with all the flats and like, they'll just throw these crazy, crazy jazz chords over the top and, and create these really elaborate chord progressions over the top of these like pop tunes and it sounds super interesting. So I was like, I'm gonna do that, but for this snare. <laughs> Cause the snare kind of has like somewhat of a melody. And I was like, I'm gonna try and reharmonize the, the artifacts of the snare. Um, so what I did is ended up coming up with this chord progression. Uh, where is it? This one, is it? Can you play it again with everything? Yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. Yeah, it'll be more impressive after I explain it, I think. And then again, I think if I had just done that for the entirety of the tune and made the whole tune based around reharmonizing to to a snare, that would also make for a boring tune. I think what makes this interesting is the fact that it just keeps changing. So for instance, the next section is just completely different. It's all modular stuff. It's obviously in the same key and the same tempo, but um, I just used idea jams from my modular synth and just cut it up to make some funky thing. So you get a change that sounds like this and it's it's kind of like this sort of soft jazzy thing and then instantly it just like goes and then into something completely different. that I made this was again just from idea jams. It was like a bunch of stuff like. Except these were just like lines I recorded out of my modular and then just cut them up in interesting ways. But I, I suppose like the overarching point I'm trying to make is that um, in terms of arrangement, I just try and make like very progressive stuff that changes like each section quite drastically. Yeah. 
rather than just sort of like meandering on an idea. And would you say this is something that you nowadays do regularly with your projects? Yeah, like cool. every project, yeah. Sick. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, I have um, a question and a half. And uh, the half question is, do you use, uh, do you automate the VPN? Do you find ways like, yeah? Not usually. Um, and the reason why is because uh, it makes it harder to play in sets. That's the main reason. Okay. And also, um, rather than automate BPM, I think what's more fun is metric modulation. Does anyone know about that? But basically, you take like whatever the, the pulse of the track is. So let's say the pulse is 120. Um, but then you have a different subdivision happening over the top of that. And then from that subdivision, you make that be the new pulse of the song. I think that's more interesting. And, and a lot of artists do it. Like um, Cohen San did it in a, in a song. I think they did it in their Rezo remix. I've done it in like two or three songs. Um, to me, it just sounds like a way more interesting way to get to a different feel. Uh, I don't remember freezing that. All right, let's go hi-hat. So let's say at 150 BPM, we have a hi-hat that's doing something like this. And then let's get a click over the top. And then over the top, let's do uh, dotted, uh, a dotted half note, I suppose. So dotted just means the value plus a half. So dotted would be like this. So the tempo is 150, which is this. <coughs> But you have two pulses going there, right? So eventually, if you remove that and then treat that as your new pulse, you know, and then that's like, dun, 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 dun. like, you know, you go from one feel at 150 to another feel slowly by having two things in the beat and then just removing the one that you were using before. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, that's usually how I would deal with tempo automation. I just think it's much more interesting than just automating tempo. Yeah, um, I was asking because, like, I'm trying, like, I'm getting inspiration from uh, live music and rock, and as a drummer, I feel like I see the tempo change when I drum in different sections of the song, mm. so I try to um, make it inside my electronic music, but it's very difficult. Yeah, I, I feel like like uh, rock and stuff does this a lot too, metric metric modulation, yeah. especially yeah, like really metal, great. like animals as leaders, they just do it like every bar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like whatever pulse is there, let's go to the least insinuated one. <laughs> And uh, the big question, you, you said before that it will take uh, another two hours to talk about, but I would love to hear uh, some uh, minimalistic tips about music, mu musicality, harmony, tonality, how do you approach it to make a uh, good sounding song in the end? Like, not in yeah. sound, but uh, uh, music-wise. Music yeah, I don't really know music theory, so I, yeah, I kind of just do, do the thing and try and hope that it's good. Um, if you want to make cool chords, there's a plugin called Scalar. This is kind of cool. You just be like, oh, what do, what do I want? Uh, C minor, um, or actually, let's go C altered scale. And then here you can just like, you know, take chords, and if you drag them down here, you can get any octave and any inversion. Usually, I'll use these these like helping methods, for lack of a better term, I suppose, for um, rather than to create my musical idea. If I'm getting stuck as like a way to do something to get me unstuck. Like I was talking about before, how I'm like kind of more of a reactionary type person. Um, if I'm like feeling stuck, I find these can be good ways to get you out of the rut. Because it's almost like you're collaborating with someone else then. You're like, hey, what's your idea? And then the plugin just goes, here's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go like, all right. <laughs> that gives me another idea now. And how about we remove all that? And then I'll just go with my new idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I've noticed that uh, like a lot of artists like Tipper, if we take a, an example of someone who has a great sound and great uh, RMS and is mastering and stuff, they do a lot of uh, like micro editing where they will, will uh, like uh, separate, like stop the sub exactly in front of the, before the snare or like do these things where your uh, strongest uh, channels, strongest tr uh, tracks and like where you have the most bass are kind of separate, not touching each other. So you don't have a lot of like RMS on, or transients like jumping and then your limiter doesn't like crash. So uh, do you do that? Like get uh, into like separating the like 
you know, watching the final wave and noticing it doesn't like. Not really. Get there is some stuff that I do though. Um, one thing that I do is I, I put soft clippers on almost everything, uh, and that way just all the tops are cut off of everything. So it's like every drum. If you look at like any drum that I make, it always looks like a little sausage. Um, <laughs> Like, for instance, that snare, if we, like, go and inspect that, you can see it's kind of like a little chunked sausage. Yeah, no transient. No real... Well, I mean, yeah, it sounds like there is, though. Yeah. But, yeah, not really. But, yeah, so everything is just sort of chopped. <laughs> and then when you send it into the limiter, the limiter is way less dis destructive because anything that's coming in is, like, yeah, not peaking all over the place. It's generally, like, really dynamic music that gets fucked up by limiters. Um, another trick that you can do if you want to avoid the limiter destroying your stuff is just put a compressor before it, just to tame the peaks before the before it goes in. Um, and another thing that a lot of dubstep people do is the opposite of, of that actually, because so many of the sounds they used are like this, they're really like sausage, they put transient shapers before their limiter. And <laughs> it sounds weird, but if you actually listen to any song that's like uh, really heavy um, and loud before it goes into a into a limiter, sometimes it can sound really weird like it can sound um, like it has Before an... Before the limiter. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like all the drums are way louder than everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah, so I think that that's why they do that. Like, for instance, um, I think this is a... I was trying to do a remix for Grizz, um, but I didn't get it finished in time. But, yeah, I can show you, like... This is just disgusting. It's way too loud. <laughs> <laughs> needs, uh, needs, needs a mix down for sure. Like, it's very much in, in the work in progress phase, but... Um, I mixed this into a limiter, so I'm pretty sure if we turn the limiter off, it's going to sound like really transient heavy. <clears throat> Let's see if it ends up opening. But yeah, volume is definitely a thing I think about a lot. If we go to the sidechain group here or any of these other groups, I'm surprised there's not that much soft clipping going on. But you can see that it's uh, grouped up the same way that my stuff is normally grouped, just the drums and the sidechain uh, groups. And then within this, you can see there's a bunch of subgroups doing a bunch of stuff. So, let's so your bass is my... Sorry, what's that? Like your bass could be sidechained by the drums, and so you well, won't everything have is like... everything sidechained by the drums. So, so you won't have like a kick or a snare really on the bass. Like what do you mean? Oh, yeah, I just was, I just was having sidechain compressors on everything. Yeah, it sucked. Um, all right, yeah, so... Let's see with the limiter how much gain we've All the gain reduction. With a song like that, I'm not necessarily worried too much about gain reduction, obviously. Um, but if we turn it off, you can hear, I think the drums will sound fairly loud. Like, the drums are way louder. Like, then when you turn the limiter on, it kind of... Is that the uh, look ahead on zero? Is that like a clip? Uh, yeah, 0 0.1. Pretty much zero. Might as well make it zero. <laughs> yeah, you want, it, you want it to be, like, super quick, so, like, everything that comes in just gets caught instantly. Because, um, yeah, if you turn the look-ahead up, it starts to, like, soften up the transients and stuff like that. The issue, though, is, like, when you have your look-ahead on zero, if you go into a breakdown that's, like, s really nice with just chords and stuff like that, um, it can start to, like, distort. And you'll notice that especially in headphones rather than speakers. Usually I'll, like, find the look-ahead eventually. <laughs> you automate your mastering. Yeah. Yeah, and usually the master is, like, super simple. It's just, like, I'll have, a like, a saturator on the master sometimes that just... Um, that just has soft clipping turned on and that's it. And then I'll mix into that. So I'm sort of just like making all the sounds sound good in the mix, but like being pushed into a soft clipper that just cuts the tops off. Or it'll be just something like this, like a simple uh, simple limiter. And then sometimes to the mastering, I'll add something like a, uh, like a Pro-Q2 and you know, I'll just cut the lows at like 20 hertz or something like that. And if it needs to be a tiny bit brighter, maybe I'll just you know, brighten it up a tiny bit like that. And then sometimes actually what I'll also do is put utility and just turn the bass mono thing on and turn DC on to just cut out all the DC offset. Uh, and then that's pretty much it. 
I won't really do anything that drastic on the master. Usually it's just limiting and, and that's it. Uh, I was wondering about your uh, processing uh, gems and idea gems. Like, when do you reach the point, like, that's it. <laughs> I'm not jamming anymore on this idea. I'm going to make right, something music. with it. Or yeah. even <coughs> when you're trying to make something with it, and then you say, okay, now I can reprocess it again and again and mm. again. Like, at what point do I kind of yeah. go, like, let's stop the processing and make music? Yeah. Just when I think it sounds good. Like, it, it, usually it happens at the point where I'll, like, create some sound that I'm like, oh, that gives me an idea. Then I'll be like, all right, no more idea jams. I'm going to, like, make that idea out of that sound that I just made. And then usually I will just keep processing stuff if it's not sounding right, um, which might actually be, like, a little bit of a crutch. You know, like, I'm using it as a way to kind of, like, fix stuff in incorrect ways or whatever, but I don't know. I think that's just my process. But it's usually more or less just when I feel like it. <laughs> There's no like set rule, I think, which I think would be weird. I mean, I, I think creative limitations are super important, so maybe it wouldn't be that, that weird, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I could sit down every day and be like, all right, 20 minutes of idea jams, 40 minutes of writing music, then I'm going to eat some yogurt, <laughs> and then I'm going <laughs> to, it's like, it just seems way too regimented. <laughs> and I'm just like way too uh, fidgety of a person, I feel like, to just like stick on to one thing for too long. Yeah, but I think that's just like a personal thing. Everyone will have their own way. Like I know people who very strictly split up their sound design days and their writing days and their mix down days and their touring schedules and stuff. For me, it's just everything's thrown into a pot and I just figure it out as I'm going. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.